Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our next edition of the 49er Industry Chat. My name is Noemi Guevara, and I am the Director of Alumni Engagement here at Cal State Long Beach. Before we start our session, I would like to in and introduce our next speaker. I would like to let you know that this, video, this webinar is being recorded and will live on our website for your viewership later on or to share with fellow alumni. And it'll be on our website at csulb.edu forward slash alumni. And now I would like to introduce your moderator for this chat. Our current, she currently serves on our CSUB alumni board. Um, Kimberly Farrell is a graduate from the College of Business and she obtained her degree in marketing in 1982. And we're so glad to have her join us today. Kimberly? Thanks, Noemi. It's a privilege to be here. Um, one, as an alumni. Two, as an alumni student athlete. And three, I'm really excited to be the moderator for Vincent Callas's session. The reason is, is Vincent and I got to know each other while being on the board for the Alumni Association. And he was the first person that caught my attention because he's so authentic, he's so sincere, and he really has a great ability to connect with people. So I've had a good connection with him for the last couple of years. And that's why I jumped at this opportunity to be the moderator. Vincent, I'm really looking forward to your talk today. It's gonna to be great. Thank you. So let me tell you a little bit about Vincent. So Vincent um, has his BA in philosophy from California State University, Long Beach. And he joined the board a couple of years ago. He's a big volunteer. You'll see him at many Long Beach State events, sponsoring the events, either with his hands on or with his kind of social networking. One of the things that I really like about Vincent is just his knowledge about the financial industry. Um, he's great at financial analysis, wealth management, retirement planning, insurance, and you may ask me, how do I know? I haven't heard the chat yet. Well, the way I know is because it didn't take me very long before I knew that Vincent was a financial planner that I wanted to get his input and get to know better from a professional basis. So I've had that opportunity. I think you're gonna be excited about what he says today. A couple other things. Vincent um, is from a multicultural family and grew up in Watts, um, of course, near downtown LA. And he's an entrepreneur. So he went ahead and has launched his, his franchise, a franchise that's part of Revolution Financial Management. And he and his family have launched this to really bring a much needed service to people about good tactics and skills and financial planning and long-term retirement planning, which I think is just so important, especially in light of COVID and everything. People have seen so much of their wealth decline and those paychecks that haven't come in. He's a really great advisor, even on what to do in the pandemic to make sure that your family is stable. Um, in addition, he underestimated and underwrote his bio. So I'm gonna add a few more things on the bio. Uh, it just speaks to his humility. But Vincent is trilingual. Um, so not only does he know English and Spanish, he also knows French. And where I think this is so important in a customer facing business is his ability to work with um, so many different multicultural backgrounds. So he's the kind of person that you can meet with not just one generation, but multiple generations and multiple um, backgrounds. So I wanted to share that because I think it's just so significant. So with that, let's get to the key event. Vincent. Uh, Kimberly, thank you for, uh... For that warm welcome and uh yeah i try to keep it um kind of lower level because if not the people start to get overwhelmed when they meet me and i'm just like look i'm just a regular guy here i, I dress down it was just having a conversation i don't want to make you feel like you're I, I know too many things it's just um i love having this conversation with many people and um thank you it's been uh it's been a joy just being able to meet people like yourself and just what the university has been able to provide the type of talent that's being that's graduating from the university, not only are you very uh, a great professional, but just a, a good, great overall person to get to know and become friends with too. It's um, yeah. it's like an amazing feeling. I had just had like long, like long term friendships, and uh, when we talk about finance and and business and all that stuff, like my background, um, yeah, I grew up in Watts, and so like that, 
just that neighborhood, that, that area, you don't talk about things like that. And when we talk about money and, and finances and, and budgeting, it has a, an emotional attachment. And most of the time it's, it's a, it's a negative emotion because um, we don't talk about those things. We don't talk about that in the family. It's kind of taboo. And um, we don't we don't really stress those things at, at the university level either. So people don't really know where to get information from. And you can go online, you can watch YouTube videos, you can do all these different things, meet different people. Um, but that always comes back at the end of the day when you're about to go to sleep and your head hits that pillow. Um, it's that emotional feeling that you get just about talking about this stuff. That people don't want to talk about it. it it's, it's a secret. So my background growing up in Watts, um, my dad had his own business. And so I would see my dad, he had a construction business and I would see him wake up early every morning, come home really late. And, um, and for my dad, it was just get the job done, pay the bills, pay the workers. That was it. It was, it was no saving. It was none of that stuff. And we didn't know anything about this stuff either. Mm -hmm. And um, my first experience with anything that has to do with finance was uh, whenever someone in the community would get killed because there was a lot of gangs that, that were there. When, whenever someone would get killed, we have to, as a community in that street, we have to go and do car washes to help pay for the funeral. And it was always that. And, and let me tell you, it, it was a closed casket funeral most of the time. And so as a kid, you know, you're five, six, seven, eight years old. My, my mom would say, hey, did you hear this kid, this son, this son the daughter was, was killed? My mind was great. Now I got to go, we got to do car washes again. And it was just that. It was always, I was like, man, why, why, was it, why do we have to do a car wash every single time somebody dies? I, I, that was my first experience with that. And, um, and then my second experience was um, going into my friend's homes and you would see the grandparents living there. The parents would live there and everyone would pull resources to help pay for medical treatment and just to help them with their day to day. So you had the grandmother, grandparents that were living at, at the same home and you had multiple children that were all working to help pay for Medicare, uh, medical care and all these other things for the, the senior person that was living there. And it was a burden sometimes because the families, they have their own lives that they want to live and they couldn't, they have to put their own stuff aside to help for, for elderly care. So I would see that all the time too. And I'm like, well, why, why didn't they like save money or why didn't they, don't they have a retirement plan? What about social security? Like what, what's going on with all these things? Nobody was taking advantage of any of that stuff. So that was just like my first experience growing up. And then I started working. Uh, I, I did start my own business. So I started my own business when I was eight. And um, I was selling uh, like these like silly putties at school. And, um, and going back to that, like I, I, I sold to the entire school. And then I already had that entrepreneurial spirit. I would get some stuff like some tips from my dad and just kind of build this business. And then eventually I, I ran out of real estate from people to sell. And then I, I gave that up. But here's the thing, right? Nobody, my parents didn't tell me that money that I was making. They didn't tell me put in a savings account. Hey, let's go and open up a checking account. Nothing. It was just cash, keep it in your pocket. And then what happened to your money? I, I, I bought fireworks or I bought toys. I bought this and that was it. And we're like, okay. I had an opportunity at a very young age to start learning these habits of saving money, but nobody taught me because my parents didn't know either. It wasn't a, something that was in the forefront. It was always just pay the bills, work, pay the bills. That's it. Make, make live another day. That was it. Um, so I started working. I started working at the airport. <clears throat> I was 18 when I started working there. I was the youngest guy. And just to give you a sense of, of how wild things are now with back then, um, I got hired on for 14 bucks an hour. Okay, this is in 2005. 14 bucks an hour, 2005. What is the minimum wage right now? 15 bucks an hour. <laughs> a dollar in 15 years. It's insane. It's insane. So if the job market, the, the pay is staying the same, it's actually getting even lower, but the bills keep rising and rising up, what are you supposed to do? What can you do? So people have to go and take multiple jobs. So anyways, I started working for the, for the airport, making good money. Again, nobody was telling me about saving or none of these things. My mom would, would kind of just mention like, hey, maybe you should put some of the money away. I put some of the money away and then guess what started happening? Bank accounts started getting bigger. And then I started having friends and family start to ask me to borrow money. And so one thing that, it t that ends up happening is when somebody tries to, to do a good thing and, and build this habit of, of, of savings, 
other people try to come in and, and try to get some of that. And because you want to help, you then start to give some of that money away and then you lose that. And then you start back at zero. So it happens all the time when we're sitting down with a client or, or, or a family member. It's like, hey, I want to pay for my child's college or I want to pay for my child's debt or this or that. And it's like you, your savings and all that stuff ends up going down to zero because you're helping somebody else out instead of teaching them to save their own money at the same time too. So these lessons I started going on. So I had the bank accounts filling up. People were asking for money. I felt bad. I'm like, okay, yeah, here's this, here's that. You'll pay me back, right? Yeah. No, I did it. <laughs> and that's fine. You know, they needed it at the time. I'm grateful that I was in a position to help. And, uh, and I learned I my lesson. Money. <laughs> yeah, I learned my lesson. So, um, so I, I started, I continued working. I was a full-time student, full-time um, um, airport, working there full-time. And then... Um, there was another incident in my life that, that it started to kind of paint the picture of like, why is this thing happening? Where I, um, I wanted a new car, okay? As a young man, you want like the flashiest, the nicest thing. So I went to the dealership with my dad, right? You always go with someone. And uh, I, I shouldn't have taken my dad. My dad's the guy, the type of guy that's like, get it now, worry about it later. Pay now, you know, who cares about it later? Like get the, get the best, like get top of the line, everything. So I'm like, yeah, I you know. He's like, when you go and buy a car, like you're getting energized. Like, yeah, like, I could do this. So I sit down, we sit down with the guy, my dad's with me and we're getting the paperwork done. And the guy was like, all right, the, the monthly payment is going to be 800 bucks a month. And I'm like, okay, I had the, I had the financial means to do it. I'm like, yeah, that's fine. And, um, and God was listening because one of my dad's workers happened to be in the area and uh, my dad's like, yeah, we're about to buy a car. Why don't you come down and visit? Guy comes down and the guy's like, can I see the contract? And he looks at it and he's like, $800 a month? What, what are you, crazy? And I'm like, well, what's the problem? I, I can afford it. And then he told me this line that changed the way I thought after that. He's like, just because you can afford it doesn't mean that you should get it. And I'm like, huh? And he picked me up by the collar and he dragged me out. <laughs> and I'm upset. I'm like, what? I, I, I'm, a, I'm a man. I could make my own decisions. And he's like, no, let's go. And the car salesman is running after me. Hey, what's going on here? And we leave. And then when you leave that, that, that moment, that space, you, you calm down. Testosterone goes down your energy. And, and you're way like, wait a minute. I was about to get into that. $800 a month for the car, not even including insurance. Insurance would have been another four or 500 bucks. But $1,300, $1,400 a month into a vehicle that's depreciating as soon as I drive it out of the lot that crazy no but no and my dad's like come on we gotta get the car like no so i need to start finding more information of what i can do so that's one lesson then the other lesson was i um i wanted to buy a motorcycle right it's not one toy i want another toy i wanted to go and buy a motorcycle so i bought the bike i didn't tell anybody this time uh i didn't want anybody to interfere with that purchase so i went by myself <laughs> big mistake i overpaid for the motorcycle and then of course um I bought another, I tried buying another motorcycle. And when I went to that dealership, the, uh, the guy that was there was like, um, again, God's listening. And he's like, wait a minute. I went in and, and I told the guy, I'm like, I want to get, I want to get that motorcycle over there. He's like, okay, well, what do you have? And he, and he, he did a, um, a budget report with me, this guy, this salesman, you sit down he's like, listen, son, we're not going to sell you the motorcycle. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, I, I thought the customer's always right. Like I thought like, if I want it, you give it to me. And he's like, no, you need, you need to walk away. I'm like, why? He's like, it's a bad deal. And I'm not going to sell you that. Why? Because you remind me of my son. Oh. And I'm like, what? And so I, again, I walked away and I'm like, what, what just happened? And eventually I went back and I'm like, why don't you want to sell me the motorcycle? And he's like, well, because look, you're still old payments on this bike. When you buy the new motorcycle, your old, the payments that you didn't pay get topped on. They get added to the new payment. So even though the motorcycle is worth $200 a month, because you didn't pay the other one, now it's going to be $600 a month. So you're overpaying for something that's not worth that. I'm like, oh, okay. So I started learning these lessons. I'm like, okay. And as I started studying philosophy, the, one of the biggest questions that we learn is why? Why? Why this? Why that? Uh, and that's helped me a lot in, in my profession where, you know, we sit down with somebody and it's like, well, what, what do you, what do you want to do? Uh, I want to buy a house one day. Okay. Why do you want to have a home? <laughs> uh, 
tell me about this home you want to purchase and they don't they don't have an idea of what that is so that's one thing that's a that's a tip that i recommend to you guys is um to be very specific in detail of what exactly it is that you want what do you want out of life what do you want for yourself because when you speak in generalities um your brain can't it can't find that it, it can't attract that so you gotta be very specific right i want to buy a car okay what Want a truck, two door, four door, red, pink, what, right? So uh, the more specific that somebody gets, the easier it is for me to help that person, okay? So um, people ask me, right? Like, well, what, what do you do? Uh, and I, sometimes I don't like telling them. I don't like telling them what I do because then they, this is the next thing that they say. I have $10,000, what should I do with it? <laughs> I don't know. I have to ask a lot of questions. I have to ask a lot of questions as to like what, what okay are you married do you have children do you own property uh is this money that you know you can play around with or is this an emergency fund like what what type of money is this because what most people are doing is they're getting their financial advice from a co-worker most of the time hey well, my co-worker said we could be doing this and that and then you know if they're doing it then maybe i can do that too and that's not enough right we gotta you gotta, you gotta ask more questions so i'm looking at the at the chat here. Um, uh, okay, yeah, so it's a, it's a good question too, Lucia, about, um, well, okay, when it comes to, to education and talking about experience and all that, it, that's always been the, 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 the main question of like the chicken or the egg, right? Is it, should you get the education first and then get experience later or should you get the experience and then, and I had this lesson taught to me very early on, I'm telling you, so my dad had his own business and um, my dad didn't go to school. Like he learned through experience. He learned as a little boy, learned, like working around a construction site, like just cleaning the mess up. And then he would ask these people, hey, can you teach me how to like cut this or how to paint that? And so he learned hands-on learning. And so the knowledge that he had, tremendous amount of knowledge to the point where he had his own business. So then what ended up happening was he would meet with some clients and some of these clients were, would say, Hey, well, where's your certification or where's, how come you don't have your title or this or that? And my dad couldn't get it because he wasn't a citizen. He, he, he didn't have, he couldn't get these things. So we, we always have to use somebody else's business things to be able to perform his own. And we always have to do like these like maneuvers just to get, get going because the way the thing was set up the framework, it, it wasn't capable of us to, to really succeed. So we have to kind of do things that weren't exactly textbook. And, and that's why I like doing what we're doing is because look, the textbook says you do A, B, and C, but sometimes you got to throw that out the window and we got to create our own luck. You got you to figure something else out, right? If, this, if they say, look, if you enter through this door, this is these things are going to happen and that door's locked for you, then you got to climb it through the window. <laughs> you got to climb it through the back end or something, but you got to create your own opportunities too sometimes. So when it comes to like experience and teaching this stuff, one of the best ways to do that is to have us right alumni come in and be a, a guest speaker or volunteer and just share your story there's a lot of organizations in, on campus that um that are looking and dying for someone to come and talk to them as a student i was part of the men's success initiative and uh and i remember they um we had different types of programs in that in that club right it wanted us to be a more successful man and part of it was family life. Um, we talked about finances. We talked about a bunch of brotherhood. We talked about a bunch of things. And, um, but we didn't have guest speakers. So it was a teacher, the professor that would teach from something that happened 20, 30 years ago. And then we wanted like up to date current stuff, like what is currently happening. And that's kind of the, the dilemma happening now is that you have professors and educators that are teaching things from many years ago that may not be entirely accurate anymore in, in especially in this time frame now of, of using zoom and online and um all these other things of like moving to the digital world you have to adapt you got to innovate and 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 how you overcome that right because the school system is already set then you overcome that by inviting a guest speaker and then they then they then tell what's currently happening current events you invite a guest speaker current events that's what's going on um that's a good question yeah. Uh, so Vincent, I want to yeah. just kind of jump in here. So yeah. one of the questions that Lucia asked was, 
how did your philosophy degree help you? And you touched on it a little bit earlier about asking why. But many times we get a certain degree and there are other things within our collegiate experience that help us really kind of apply more than just the academic experience to business and yeah. life. Can you maybe explain what your life lessons and more about how your philosophy degree has helped you? Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the things that, that people would always mention too was, uh, I would tell them, right, hey, uh, as a student, I would tell my, my family, like, I'm gonna study philosophy. And then my parents were like, well, what are you gonna do with that? Like, there's, there's no job for that. And I'm like, I know, I don't, I don't wanna get a job. Like, like it, it, there was never the conversation of like, well, why don't you just create a job? It was never that. It was like, well, you, you go to school, you get good grades, you graduate and you get a good paying job. And then when you get a good paying job then you can do all these other things. That, that wasn't my path. So I wanted to study philosophy because I, I love, for me, it's, it's the foundation of everything. Once you start asking a question about anything and enough of those questions are being answered, then it becomes its own science. What's that up in the sky? Stars, astronomy. What's going on with the body? Medicine, right? How, why is it that people do what they do? Like psychology, right? So like for me, it was like the foundation of everything. So in our philosophy degree, we have to study many of those things. You have to study um, human behavior. We have to study history. Uh, we have to study, um, you know, just the co so many different levels of, of interaction between us, ourselves, why we think the way we think, and how it's really helped me in my business is, is understanding that sometimes we, in our own mind, we're very, very, very critical of how we view ourselves. That's one. We, if, if you can hear the things you tell yourself in public, you'd be in jail. <laughs> We, we treat ourselves so badly in our own minds. And so understanding that, look, sometimes my, my thoughts are wrong. Sometimes the way I view things are incorrect. So then I need to go and shift and then say, where can I go and get accurate information? Or how do I change and adapt what I currently know? And then really diving deep into why I feel that way. Why is it that I'm thinking that? I know for a lot of us, a lot of the professionals that, that have been on these industry chats, we've all had that feeling of, um, of that imposter syndrome. Am I really good enough to be able to give somebody advice? Like, who am I to talk, right? I, I think about that all the time too. Like me growing up in Watts and then I studied philosophy and ended up in finance. What? <laughs> How did I end up in finance? I, I, I'll get into that as well. So I, um, about that motorcycle, right? The other, the guy didn't want to sell me the bike. So I went to another guy. This guy uh, obviously said yes. So I bought, an, uh, I bought a bigger motorcycle and I ended up crashing. I oh, crashed man. on the bike, uh, I broke my collarbone and uh, yeah, it was all bad. And, um, and as a student, okay, so I'm still working. I, I can't work anymore because I, I, I was an instructor there. I was, a, I was a trainer. I can't go to work. You can't go to work with a sling and a cast. So I had to go on disability. And um, what ends up happening with that is when you have, I was fortunate enough to have a job that has disability, first of all. Okay, there's a lot of jobs out there that don't have nothing. There's no benefits, no sick time, no vacation, no nothing. So it's very fortunate that I had a job that had that. But here's what they didn't tell me. They didn't tell me that it takes months until that paperwork is finally processed. So what ends up happening? The bills start to rack up. What am I gonna tell the landlord? Well, oh, I, I can't pay right now because I gotta, that's not their problem. <laughs> Right, I didn't have a savings. I didn't have anything. So I had a credit card. So I started living off of credit cards. So I started realizing, wait a minute, um, how am I gonna get out of this hole? Physically, I'm beat up. I can't earn income. How do I start to earn money while I'm not there? I started thinking about this stuff. Um, I was still going to school too, by the way. And I had to enroll in the, in the disabled uh, student services. I don't know what they call it now but I had to go there and they assigned me someone that, that would take notes for me and would carry my books and <laughs> all these like an assistant. And, and I felt bad. I felt bad having this person there taking notes and trying to learn the material and then give it to me. And, and I'm there like uh, drugged up from pain, you know, <laughs> and it, it was all bad. So I, um, so I had to figure stuff out. So I went to the disabled student services and I told them like, thank you for providing this resource here, but I, I need to figure this out on my own. 
Okay, so I figured things out on my own. I, I had to learn to write my own notes. I would use my, my cell phone. I had to learn, um, there's a feature called swipe, where instead of typing the buttons, you just kind of move your finger around and you, and you, 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 you know, create the word. And I, I would write my papers like that. So just, and I would go to my professor, and I would tell him, don't give me extra time. Don't treat me as if I was anybody different. If the paper's due on Friday, you're gonna get it on Friday, right? Like don't, don't treat me any differently. And it's just like that, that sense of like a challenge of like, maybe I could do this. If, if, the, the, if the odds are against me, maybe I can overcome this. And, and that feeling that I have is the same feeling that I have with the clients. Hey, you're in a bad spot right now, but let's overcome this. We can figure this stuff out. And I'm not the one that does it all the time either. I have a team and sometimes the team doesn't do it either, but we have other resources that are able to help. It's like in the, in the business that I'm in, you're able to meet so many different professionals in all aspects, all walks of life. And, um, and you get to leverage those relationships that you have to help this one person out. So it, it feels good. It feels good to be able to help somebody out. Sorry. I, yeah. And see, so have another question there. Kimberly. I love it. It's great. There's a lot of things here. So, um, Thank you for that insight. Um, I really like the part about you have to understand how you think in order to see what's happening with you to really understand yourself first before you can start to kind of navigate the world around you or other people. It's really, um, really important. So a couple things here. How's COVID impacted your business? And what kind of impact has it had on your clients? How has it changed what you do with your clients because of COVID? That's a great question. Um, COVID has impacted my business in a positive way. <laughs> um, so here's the thing with being in, in financial services is that um, it doesn't matter what the economy is doing. You, I still have an opportunity to build and expand the business. If the economy is great, it means people are making money. It means people want to save and, and get different products and services. Great. If the economy is doing bad, then people want protection and safety. So then I can help them with that stuff too. So as far as like what's going on with the economy and, and, and COVID-19 affecting it, like it, it's actually on an upward trend because now it's forcing people to understand the importance of having an emergency fund. It's forcing people to understand the importance of saying, I saved some money years ago into this retirement plan. And because of COVID-19, I have access to that now. It's forcing people to, to think of their own health. Hey, if I get sick, how am I gonna keep paying the bills? Because if I have to be quarantined and all these other things, so it's forcing people to say, I need to get life insurance. Maybe I need to get disability insurance. So if, if I'm sick and unable to go to work, I still have some source of income coming in so I can still keep my lifestyle. So it's forcing a lot of people to really look into their finances. And these are things that we've been kind of preaching about since I first started, you know, it's always that, hey, save, save your money. Eh. Hey, you need to start, you know, make sure you, you, you put money into your retirement accounts. Eh. And, then, and now it's like, oh You're man, I should have done those things. <laughs> uh, so it's forcing people to think of, okay, when the economy recovers, I have to then set aside money to do these other things. That's one. The other one is um, because of the um, there's unemployment assistance, there's people are, are, are working from home now. And so now it's creating extra funds that they're not wasting on gas or food or whatever else, these other things when you're out, out and about. So now that people have a reserve of three, four or 500 bucks every single month because they're not spending money on those things, right? The, the auto insurance, they lowered their rates because people weren't driving. So that's extra money in your pocket. So now people are sitting on, on, on cash. And then on top of that, you're getting the stimulus check. So it's, it's an unprecedented time right now as far as like what people can do with their money. The, right. the, the reminder, the importance of it is like right at the forefront. And um, so it's been affecting my business in a positive way because it's just, we got a lot of opportunity, a lot of things that we can tinker with. And wow. uh, it's been good. And then as far as like how we've shifted, We've been um, using Zoom for, for over a year now. So we've been doing this stuff anyways, because I have clients, I have friends and family that are in other states. We would use Zoom to communicate with them, to talk to them. So when the whole thing shifted over, I spoke to our team. We're like, we're going to shift our business operations to go from face-to-face, -face, which is still something that's needed, 
face to face to now let's go virtual a virtual meeting everybody has their zoom accounts okay go ahead and and still be able to you know service and help your your friends and your family and, and your clients too so um it's been we, we haven't missed the beat great so the whole Damn. thing started happening it was just okay zoom shift over everybody shift over to zoom and then that was it and then the business has been growing growing and growing <laughs> because yeah. of what's been happening it's, it's been a, a wild time right now um that CARES Act that they signed, that the that, that Congress signed, um, it's, a, it's been a boon right now, but I know that we're going to pay the price for that down the line. There's no free money. Like they always tell us there's no free lunch. So take advantage of it right now. Because right. I don't know what's going to happen four or five years from now to the government signed a blank check, in other words. And they said, here you go to whether you're a Uber driver or you were laid off or your hours were cut off, it's free money that's being thrown out to people to try to stimulate the economy. It's insane. It's insane right now. And I'll show you guys just some of the websites that you guys can go on yourselves to use these resources because the, the, the resources are starting to dwindle. Take advantage. It's happening. That's a right great now. idea. Now I know a lot of your clients too, you have some small entrepreneurial business clients and things. So they too, you have the ability to consult with them on some of these resources, right? Yeah, yeah. We, it, the best part of what I do is we're able to either sit down with an individual or a family or a business. It could be a business of like four employees, or it could be a business that has 20, 40, 50 employees. And we're just able to do, it, it's, we're doing the exact same thing with all of them. Okay. Right. And anyone could do the work that I'm doing. What, what are we doing? What's coming in, what's coming out. And Great. then that gap, how do we increase that gap? So then you can take those funds and then put into whatever you want. Vacation, fun, retirement, whatever, that's it. What's coming in, what's coming out, that's it. And as All we right. sit down with people, we're trying to like break down like, well, what, what, where's your money going? So one example <clears throat> is, um, you know, somebody has T-Mobile, okay? T-Mobile, they have Netflix with your account already included. Okay, so I sit down with someone and T-Mobile has Netflix, but then they already have, a, then this client already has Netflix individually i'm like why are you double paying for the same service it's it's just these little things that are going on that we just don't know you just yeah. swipe or everything's automated and, and out of sight out of mind and it's like you're 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 burning money away i don't know about you i don't want to lose one penny so that that's what we do you know that's a great example and it really ties to one of the questions that we just got from one of the listeners um, how early should students learn about savings and investments and budgets? And kind of this example speaks to it is make sure you're not double paying for something, right? Like Netflix. Yeah. yeah. Um, so with my experience, so I've taught at a high school, we've talked about finance and budgets and, and all that stuff. And um, we kind of go in with that idea of like, okay, we're going to teach them everything. But it, it doesn't, the, the younger you go, the, the simpler it has to be. And um, when you start getting into like the real details is when that student starts to get a part-time job. So if they work at Disneyland part-time or Knott's Berry Farm or McDonald's or whatever, once they start to get that first paycheck, you show them that pay stub. And now we can start talking about this stuff. Look, you gotta pay for something called Medicare. You gotta pay for social security. You see this thing, it's called taxes, okay? You, because what you're earning isn't what you're gonna what you're getting paid for. You're not gonna earn that. It's what what hits the bank account. And so people don't realize this stuff. Like, so as soon as somebody starts to work, then we can start really bringing into this topic of like saving and all that other stuff. You can start teaching your kids now about budgeting and all that stuff. When you include, it has to be a family conversation, anyways. There's right. this book that I I uh, let me see if I have it over here. I'll, I'll show you guys. So every time I have I sit down with the client and they have younger children. I give them that book. I'm like, here you go. Use this for yourself because you have to have this family conversation. Let me, let me grab it real quick. Yeah, great. Grab it. Wonderful. So this, this will um, there you go. To this question on resources. People were asking, what do you read? What are Secrets. your resources? Self-made millionaires teach their kids. Love it. What are right. some of the pearls in that book? Like give us um, the top three things. So a lot of these things that are in here, they're not, um, financial strategies okay they're not that when, when when i sit down with someone they're always thinking okay what, what's what's the what's the next uh you know tax exempt stuff we don't it's mindset okay what what is it that you're talking about here you're talking about look somebody that has a lot of money doesn't necessarily mean that they're a good person 
Okay, we're talking about, look, people that have a lot of money, they can donate to charity. So we're talking about kind of like different higher level concepts here. We're not, we're not talking about dollars and cents anymore. We're talking about mindset and how you're viewing money because the relationship that we have with money starts at a young age. And it starts from how your parents viewed it. So me growing up, right, my dad would, would buy us whatever we wanted. So I had no concept of money. I had no concept of cost. However, when I was with my mom, my mom was um, a, a penny pincher. She was very, very frugal. My mom would, she would have a pencil and you know, you get, you get the pencil this right and then she would sharpen and use it to the point where it was just a tip. And as long as it would write, she'd still have it. So my mom took it to the one extreme and then my dad took it to the other. My dad had like 50 pens and you know, he, he wanted a fresh one all the, so it, it was like, I had these two extremes. It was like humble thinking and then my dad's level of abundance, but not like in reality either. Because it, so I, I was stuck in the middle of that. And I had to kind of figure things out on my own. And I learned that stuff when I started my own business too. You know what, one great thing too that, that, that kids start to learn about this is, um, you know, most of the schools, they have like their fundraising and they sell chocolates. <laughs> yeah. They do their fundraising, they sell chocolates and they sell whatever t-shirts or whatever, they, or they do, um, uh, Forgot the name of it. Um, Almond Roca or gift wrap. Yeah, they do a bunch of little things like that. So that's when the students start to learn about that stuff. Only if the parent starts to explain what's going on. Hey, son. Hey, daughter. Do, why do you think we have to fundraise? Because the school doesn't have enough resources to pay for these books that you have. Why is that? So you have to go and then earn that money to bring it back to the school so you can get a better education. And there's another level of like, well, why is the school able to provide this stuff to begin with? So it's still these other questions too, but... It, you learn at that. So the, the younger you are, um, you can have that conversation at a very young age. So you, you can do something called a family economy, right? So if you have your kids, you say, all right, every time you clean the room, you'll get, you'll get a buck. Or at the end of the week, you'll get, you know, $4 or something. And if you do your chores all week, then I'll put that into a family savings account that's going to grow at 30% interest. Okay, so if you do this, you'll see, look, it'll grow at this, at this rate. So you, you can start to create all these things and start bringing in a healthy relationship with money. Because most of the time, what do we say? Money doesn't grow on trees. Or you ask your, your, your parents something, you're like, what, what, what would they say? What, what do you think, I made out of money? And so you have this negative connotation of money and, you, and you're, you're viewing it as if it's something that's hard to, to attain. That is hard work, that is frustrating, that is, why are we putting that into our, into our kids? Hey, money comes easy, right? The more money you have, the, the more you can help people, the more you can give away. So, in create it's mindset stuff most of the time that we're talking whenever i sit down with someone it's mindset why do you think the way you think what happened in your childhood where did you grow up who told you that it always goes back to that and the philosophy thing helps like where where did you learn that who put that limiting belief in your mind that you couldn't do some of these things that's really what this is all about because sometimes we people are in debt or they're overwhelmed by so many different things and they, they gave up and it's like, no, like, look, yeah, you might've gotten knocked down, but get back up. Fight's not over yet. It's fourth quarter. We can still win this. And it's kind of like a pep talk all the time. You know? And you, Kimberly, with your, your athletic background, you can relate to that. It's like that, that camaraderie, like, you know, we can keep going, you know, but we're not done yet. We're still in the fight. Let's keep going. And it's incremental wins that eventually compound to something bigger. That's so true. Vincent, you remind me of one of my favorite athletic coaches. So uh, I totally just made that connection. So one of the things that um, one of our participants wants to hear a little bit more about is sometimes there are those aha moments when you're with clients and all of a sudden the client goes, oh, right. Can you think of a couple of examples and share that with our audience? <laughs> yeah. So um, and the, the, the funniest one, um, was for both of us actually. So it was one of my, I wasn't, when I first started, I wasn't going to church right off the bat. Okay. I went to Catholic school my whole life. So I didn't want nothing to do with church at the time. And then what, what I'm telling you, God laughs sometimes. So what does he do? He puts this client in front of me that was so devoted to going to their church that they were giving um, almost half of their income to the church. So when I'm sitting down with someone, this, per this person was negative every single month, negative. She had a, a daughter with, with disabilities and, um, and I'm like, why are you giving so much money away to the church? Like, why don't you just not, you have more time. Why don't you donate your time instead of your money? And, um, and so we started crunching the numbers and, and that aha moment came when it's like, well, it, it, 
it stems from why was she giving so much away in in her belief in that the more i give the more i'm going to get back that 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 was her foundation of savings to the church to get to tithing the law her, her, of giving. Her, her, her belief was that if i give 500 bucks a month then that means that i'm going to be getting 1500 that's why i keep doing that i'm like the, the principle doesn't work that way is <laughs> you have to release the funds willingly with with no expectation of receiving something back that's how that principle works right so there was that aha moment oh okay so then now we started shifting some of that to something else it, it's it goes back to that right like where are you learning these who told you that like why do you think certain things um another aha moment was we sat down with the business owner and uh and what he wanted to do, again, great guy. I love working with this guy. He has his employees. And in order for, for he, he wanted to protect them from themselves, from saying, look, I'm going to force them to put some of this money away from their pay. So I'm going to over, I'm going to pay them well. And from that paycheck, I'm going to automatically deduct 10% and put it into this account here so that I force them to save money. And during the hiring interview, he would, because he owned his own business, he could do whatever he wants. He would tell that to people, Hey, I'm going to pay you this amount, but 10% of that I'm going to put into this account for your emergency fund that I'm going to help you build. So like, okay, great. Sounds like a good idea in, 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 in theory. Okay. It sounds great. Yeah. Hey, help your, help your employees save money. Great. But I was like, well, let's dive into this thing. And then what he didn't realize is that the employees could access these accounts on their own because it's their money and withdraw their, their funds and then leave that account at zero. <laughs> so the intention was good, but the practice wasn't. So we have to go back and then we have to go and start teaching the, the, the employees of like why you should be putting some of this money away versus somebody forcing you to do it. And then now, because you weren't involved in that decision-making, you want to kind of go against that, counter that, and then do your own thing. So we have to go back to the education side of things. Like, well, look, the reason that your boss wants to do this is because he wants you to save money. The reason he wants you to save money is because when he started building this business, he got into some debt and he got into these jams, into these problems and it affected him a lot. And he cares about you guys so much that he doesn't want that to happen to you guys. Oh, okay. All right. Let them then put the 10% away. So it's just these little explanations. But I, I love what I do because it, it, every day when I walk into somebody's office or how, I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea whether we're going to put out the fires where or what, um, or, or if, if I'm going to walk in there and, and there's nothing for me to do. I, I mean, there's clients that we do that. I walk in, I'm like, you got everything covered, actually. Good job. I have, there's nothing I can do here. Right. <laughs> and I walk away. So it's just, it, it's a mystery all the time. So a variety. Vincent, you're so passionate and I love it. And it seems like you're giving a lot of advice. Can you think of a time a client really took off with your advice and great things happened? Yeah. Um, it was one of my friends actually. So she, uh, at the time she had gotten a divorce and, um, you know, a lot of people they they don't get married with the intention of like, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to get divorced. So she went through a divorce that in its in and of itself is an emotional roller coaster to begin with. Um, I think a good um, kind of example of that is like if you, I don't know if you guys seen that 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 movie Marriage Story on Netflix. Oh yeah. my, it, yeah, like that. <laughs> um, constantly paying the attorneys, right? Like you lost your income, right? So, so th there's she wasn't working at the time, so her taking care of the kids allowed him to go and earn high income. So when they got separated, right now, now he has, um, you know, you got to split the profits here. You got to split the, the retirement accounts. You got to, there's alimony, there's all these other things. So, but she had nothing. So she went to get a part-time job. And that's kind of the, the tough part too, is like when you don't have a job to begin with and you go through a divorce, now what, what do you put on your resume? <laughs> you don't have anything to, to put on there. So she had to start from scratch. And so with her, the, the only goal that we had from her was to not be negative. So she was negative like $300 every single month. The goal with her was just to be, go to zero. <laughs> don't, don't save any money, just don't owe anybody anything. And it took us over two years, every single month of her just slowly, like a snail's pace of putting things away and this and that. So finally when she ended up getting the zero. But because of that belief of like, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm not gonna leave you. Uh, I'm going to support you the whole way. I'm gonna, we're going to see this thing through, 
We're not, I'm, I'm not the kind of guy that's like, well, you should do this, this and that. Call me in, in three months and let me know how it goes. I'm, I'm in the hole with you. I'm in the mud with you because I was there with, I know what that feels like. And so we're slowly crawling through this and eventually getting from negative 300 to zero dollars. Man, we cried just celebrating. Okay, now the next step is getting you more money. So now we work on your, your resume and start applying for full-time jobs. So you can start bringing in more money so you can start saving some money. So just yeah. little things like that, it, it, it feels good, but it, it takes a lot of work. Yeah. A lot of work. So Vincent, we're right at the Q&A section and there's some really great questions coming through. One of them is, where do you usually begin with your new clients? Where do you begin? Uh, first off is um, just start talking about just their, their upbringing, history. T tell me about yourself. I start with that. Tell me about your parents. Where'd you grow up? Did you go to school? Did you go to college? Um, like, I, I want to know kind of their, their story so that then I can then be able to be a, an effective um, communicator with them, right? So mm -hmm. when we sit down with someone, it's not, I tell you, it's not just about dollars and cents. It's not, it, there's a 90% of everything we're doing is emotional, is communication. If I can't connect with this person, they're not going to want to do anything anyways, even if the plan is good for them. So I got to figure out what type of personality they have, what kind of upbringing they have. And then I can then start talking about something. Okay. We have people that are like, I don't want to know the details. Just get it done. Okay. <laughs> no explanation needed. And then you have others that are like, how does this w line by line? Okay. Yeah. This, uh, this other thing works line by line. So I, I got to figure that stuff out first before we even talk about anything. I need to know whether I'm even able to help you. <laughs> That's the first thing. What is, Am I able to help you? And then two, do I want to help you? Because <laughs> sometimes you have people that are just, they're, they're going downhill fast and there's nothing you can do for them. You got to let them crash and burn. And then once that sting goes away, then they'll come back and then be more open to getting advice. But yeah. first thing is that. Great. Um, in your opinion, how long do you think it will be before, and I know it's a tough question, the economy really recovers from COVID? Oh, man not going to be this year. I'll tell you that, you know, um, there's this false sense of the economy is doing great because you happen to have money in the bank. Okay. Um, I have a lot of, uh, colleagues and friends that because of the stimulus check and because they're getting unemployment assistance and all these other things that they think the economy is good. It's not, you got to remember what happened in the beginning. What happened? Everybody had a job. Most people had a job. Everything was going great. You're susceptible to being laid off just like that. And again, you're going to fall back into this hole. And you can't keep waiting for the government to bail you out all the time. So when is the economy, economy going to recover? It's not going to be this year. I mean, we're halfway through. Honestly, it's going to be probably over a year um, okay. before things start to kind of level, like really level off. Right. Somebody that's sick, it, it could, it, it's, it's a pandemic happening that that person could affect somebody else and that loses. It's, it's too much, too many variables, but it's, it's not going to be this year. Right. So often people um, avoid meeting with a financial planner like yourself that has all this background and success because they're concerned. Oh, I can't even afford to meet with him. Is there like a period where people can meet with you before there's a invoice that comes to them or something. Cause I think a lot of people don't really understand yeah. how does that work and it may keep them from even reaching out. Yeah. It's a good question too. And, um, well, there, there's the, uh, that assessment in the beginning, right? It's that question. Like, I don't even know if I can help you. Why don't we sit down and just talk about what your situation is and then let's see, let's go from there. And then everything's already up front. If we're going to help you in these certain situations, this is what the cost is going to be. Yeah. Okay. Um, and sometimes it's not even an emotion. It, it's not a physical cost. It's, it's an emotional investment of like, you're going to have to follow through with this plan for a while. So I need you emotionally ready to continue this thing. Sometimes not even about the price, but um, there's different types of advisors that exist out there. Some um, get paid off a commission. So I get the job done. I get compensated. You have another type of advisor that's fee only that says, all right, uh, we're going to work over all these things and then you pay me one time and then we're done. And then you have others that are kind of a, like a subscription service, like a kind of like a Netflix account where like you're paying every single month to this advisor 
and you have access to them all month long, however many times you want to call them throughout the day. So there's different types. Um, one of the things that you guys can start doing, you can do this on your own, create a budget, know what you're, know what's happening. There's apps that exist that is going to help you learn to manage your money. That's what we're doing in the first place. Remember what I said, what's coming in, what's coming out. How, how big is this gap here? That's it. That's just, you can do that, but people don't have the discipline to do it or they, they just lazy. I don't want to do that. Or they have this belief in their head that they're not good with numbers. So then they don't even want to attempt it. So we come in and we just kind of help. We're, 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 we're allies. We're, we're on the same page here. We're on the same team. So what are a few sites and resources you can just tell people right now yeah. that you so, recommend? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm going to burn through these pretty quickly. So there's so many resources that exist out there. And um, let, me, uh, let me, let me show you guys. Okay. So, all right. Don't forget about this thing here. You have um, energy assistance. So they can, you can get a, a, a free refrigerator. You get light bulbs to get more energy efficient costs so that you don't have to pay that much in your electricity bill. Um, we got the replace your ride. Okay, this is, all, this is all stuff that's out there. Okay, what does it say here? Look, it says qualified applicants can resell to 9,500 to replace their older high polluting vehicles with a newer vehicle. You gotta go through the process and apply. So if you're driving an old vehicle and you, you're thinking about getting something new, look into this program. They, they could help you find into getting something even better. And they could, they could subsidize some of that cost, which is amazing. Um, we got pandemic unemployment assistance. So depending on what state you live in, it might be called something different, but um, this is for people that have 1099 jobs. So if you have, uh, you know, you drive Uber or, you know, you do whatever other job that's 1099 independent contractor, you, you're getting some funds here. You got to apply for this thing though. Um, pandemic unemployment assistance is for California. So it might be something else if you're in a different state. Okay. Um, here's this one with the SBA. These are, these are some loans that, that are out there because of the CARES Act that you don't have to pay back. That can tell you, this is it's an unprecedented amount of time right now with, with what's going on. So these are the things. Payment protection program. If you own a business, you should be looking into this stuff. It's money that they're gonna give you that you don't have to pay back. Same thing with the EIDL loan. So it's $10,000 advance that you don't have to pay back. It's, it's insane. It's an insane period that we're in right now. If you don't qualify for some of these things, give it a shot still. Um, you can, and, and for this one, by the way, the, the EIDL, you can also do that if you're a 1099. If you're an independent contractor, you can still apply for that loan. It's crazy. Um, we have this one here, uh, unclaimed property. You'd be surprised how many people um, don't understand that there's money that's owed to them, but because they changed their cell phone or because they moved or whatever, they couldn't get in contact for, uh, to them. So type in your name, type in your name and see if something's owed to you and then get that stuff back. It's yours, right? There's, there's money floating around. I want you to grab it. And then this one here, right? Um, annual credit report. Just just figure out what's what's on your um, your report here. It's, it's not it's not going to tell your credit score, but it'll tell you you know what kind of loans you've had, what kind of debt that that you didn't pay off, or what if this thing is legit. Because there's there's been cases of identity theft where somebody stole somebody's identity and they started ranking up all these charges, and then that's affecting on your report. And we're like, wait a minute, I didn't do these things, and you got to come in and dispute that because that's lowering your credit score. So those are all free resources. Look into them. It's free stuff. My job is to get you more money. That's it. And whether you want to pay me or not, great. I don't care. I want to help people because somebody took the time to do that for me. That's, what, that's, what, that's my driving force. If somebody took the time to do that to me, to help me out, I want to do that for other people too. There's, there's an, uh, I'm in a state of an abundance. There's plenty of opportunity, plenty of money, plenty of resources out there. Just take advantage of them. Like I said, there's these websites on here. Look, look into them. You, nobody's working right now. You, you don't have to drive. So you're at home anyways. Log into those things. All right. Great. So Vincent, um, here's a really good question. Say somebody is sitting on their um, stimulus check. They've got their $1,200. What would you recommend is a good place to invest it? As don't invest it. Do an investment. emergency fund. It's an emergency fund. So put in your savings. Don't touch Take it. that. Because okay. we're thinking of like how, how do we, an investment is a future idea. You're in the hole right now. You needed that check to survive. You need to start building an emergency fund. That's the first thing. You, that's the foundation. Build an emergency fund. Once you have enough, three months, maybe six months worth, 
then start thinking about other things. We're always thinking about future. Oh, if I can put this money, no one's going to care if you're broke and you're about to get evicted. But I have stocks and bought. <laughs> Pay the stuff now. It's like build your emergency fund. All right. Here's a good um, question. Um, Vincent, have you ever led small group investment groups or anything via Zoom? Yeah, we, we do. Um, you know, like I said, we, we have like, even today we're doing, uh, it's already booked, but today we're doing like this thing called a, a mini millionaires group chat for the kids. So we talked about, so we're using the book so that the kids can start to learn about these things. So yeah, we do that with families. We do that, you know, with companies. Um, we, we would, we used to host them at our office, but because of the, you know, social distancing and all that, we have to go virtual, but yeah, yeah. I, we got the account that has over a thousand people that can log on. <laughs> That's wonderful. Now, Noemi, somebody asked about, of course, getting access to Vincent's video to share with their son. Um, I just want to assure them that that is part of what you've always done with the protocol to make those available on the site, right? Is that on the alumni site, Noemi? Yes, they will be living on our uh, alumni site, um, csualumni.edu forward slash alumni, and just click on the 49er chat. Excellent. All right, cool. Yeah, All if, right. Um, you know, if you guys want to reach me, the, I'm on social media already, so just Google my name and something will pop up. If not, call Noemi. Here's her here's her phone number. Here's her social security. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm on LinkedIn too. Yeah. So well, Vincent, what a great example of somebody who didn't have a financial background, who has jumped in, learned everything you need to learn in order to help your clients. You're clearly very passionate about helping people. Um, it's wonderful. It's one of the things that made me want to really connect with you from the very beginning. But I also see how his philosophy degree from Cal State University, Long Beach, um, has given him a lot of emotional IQ and critical reasoning. And um, he's great with the questions and really figuring out the why. So I just want to tell you, I enjoyed this so much today. I hope that all of our listeners and everyone from Long Beach State that's online um, has enjoyed it. Noemi, now I want to pass it back to you. Thank you, Kimberly. What a great um, conversation you had and great great tips for our alumni. Um, thank you to, for everyone for tuning in today. Again, like we've just shared, a, this video will be living on our website so you can share with um, family and friends and um, fellow alumni. Just a reminder to follow us on social media at CSUB Alumni to learn about future programming like this one. So we thank you for your time and have a great day.